Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We just lift up our hearts and spirits to you this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come be with us, Lord. We love you so much. Hallelujah. Give him praise this morning. That's what his mercy's done for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Oh, be set free today. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is all good. It's all good in the house of the Lord. Why don't you shake somebody's hand and say to them, it's all good. It's all good this morning. <laughs> Praise God. Introduce yourselves if you don't recognize them. <laughs> Praise God. Praise you, Jesus. I get it. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord. 
We welcome you this morning. Good to have you out. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, we welcome you. God bless you. Good to see you guys. Good to have you in the house of the Lord. The people here visiting with us this morning that were part of our VBS. What a wonderful week it was. It was a powerful week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to that dream team. Every one of you, the coaches, the workers, the helpers. Give them a big hand. Everybody who had a part. I want to thank the hospitality team that worked so hard, put on quite a spread on Friday night. People just were expecting chips and a hot dog that came in and had a feast. It was just tremendous, just a great week, great punctuation at the very end. So we are so excited that we had a chance to pour out, you know. As Jesus said to his uh, disciples, they got a little winded and tired in ministry. He said, come away with me to a quiet place. Let's get some rest. Let's just go there. Ah, rest. Ah, rest. Do we know how to rest anymore? Do we know how to rest anymore? And if you keep reading that scripture, you'll find that people recognized them and they saw them going and all the people went ahead of them. So they were waiting for them. The place of rest turned into a place of ministry once again for Jesus. The Lord, he just never takes a break. He keeps ministering, keeps resting, you know, and he ministers. Get your rest when you need your rest. Let the Lord recharge your batteries. Let the Lord fill you to overflowing this morning and encourage your heart. Praise God. Is Ben Raymond here? Josh, your brother here? No, not here today. Ben is off to uh, Bible College starting Wednesday. It's hoping to pray for him this morning, but he's off to Lancaster Bible College. And I pray God's blessing be upon him. It's exciting to see people coming from our church, being sent out and going into ministry. What an exciting thing. Exciting time. We do have special guests. Reverend Tom and Angela Carpenter are with us this morning. Praise God. You guys want to do that right now? Come and give greetings. Come on up, you guys. Let's give them a warm hand. They're from Compassion Link. Well, it is such a privilege to be back. This is actually our third year to get to be here on this particular Sunday in August and just beginning to feel like home. Some of you were meeting for the first time, but I just want to say thank you so much to this church that has a heart for missions, a heart for people, and I don't say that just as a something to say. I genuinely feel that and believe that and appreciate you all for that, and it's um, you feel it when you come in the door. You see it by all the missionaries that are on the wall. And we are just honored to be friends with Pastors Mike and Kim Ferguson. Thank you for supporting Special Touch. Some of you can go, some of you can give, and and everyone can pray. And so please do pray for our week. And uh, we're honored to be friends with Pastor Gary and Pastor Janice. And um, just such an an encouragement to our lives. So thank you. Thank you for having us today. Amen. I'd like to share with you a little bit about what you're helping us do, and not just us, but also uh, the Compassion Link team, of which uh, Amy and David Julian, which you guys support and got family here in the church. We work, we work right around the corner from, from David's office and Amy's office, and, and we work on some of these projects together. And I have some pictures of things that we're actually doing together with the Julians. Uh, the first picture uh, that we have up there. <coughs> This, this is part of the special touch and the his ability portion of Compassion Link. Um, pet therapy is a big deal. For people with disability, uh, the numbers just go up really high. When, when someone with a disability has something that they can care for or something they can do, and pet therapy is a real thing, and it's really kind of a neat thing we're experimenting with, and rabbits really work really well for pet therapy. And, and uh, if you don't believe me, just ask the ladies at our office. They, they spoil my rabbits. These are my rabbits, and, and they're not just there to look pretty or to pet. We also have projects that we do with those rabbits. Uh, the next picture will show that black container right there. That black container, we actually take the rabbit waste and we put it in that black container, in that funnel, and we put it in there. 
Okay, so so this is good stuff. Rabbit rabbit uh, waste does not stink like chicken waste. Okay, so you can you can use that and you recycle it really quick. But what we make with with that is we make a real potent fertilizer that we can put on our gardens. But not only that, we the, it makes methane. It makes gas, and it's pumped from the black tank into the white tank right there. And we have enough methane captured in that tank. For every five pounds of waste from the rabbits and from plant matter we put in there, it creates three hours of fuel that you can burn, you can use in a generator or a cook stove. And so people with disabilities can use that. They can raise their rabbits, they can heat their home or heat this greenhouse that we have right there. And in that greenhouse, it's all kind of recyclable stuff. It's all self-contained and sustainable. And, and we, we grow in that greenhouse. Go to the next picture. We have a garden bed right there that's completely an aquaponics or aquaponics uh, system. There's no dirt in that grow bed. That's all water. And our plants are growing there. And the water flows from that grow bed into another tank that is fish. We, we raise fish in those barrels. And we have right now, well, we just, we just harvested 50 catfish, but we have 100 tilapia in those, uh, in those tanks right now. And so the fish waste goes and fertilizes the plants, and it's all kind of goes in a, in a big circle. But, but it's all heated by the different things right there that you see the big barrel was, that's another heating source that we can use. We use, again, the waste material to burn in that. And then the next picture shows, uh, a lot of this is designed by David, by the way. Uh, he's really helped out. We have grow beds here with, with tires. We use old recyclable tires. To, all this is very accessible to people with disabilities because we find out that overseas, much of the disability community, the reason we have disabilities is because of poor nutrition, poor water. And, and then what do you do with the people who do have disabilities? They, they have no source of income except to beg. But with this, you see it's all small and self-contained and easily accessible to them. They can, they can sit in their chair and harvest their, their fruit. In, in our grow bed in the greenhouse, house, we can average 38 heads of lettuce a week. That's quite a bit. That we have two grow beds in there, and, and the, what you saw in there was, that's water spinach right there, and it's just, man, it grows too fast. And then you could take that, the leftover of that, uh, feed it to the rabbits. And so it's, it's all self-sustaining right there. And maybe one more picture. And that's our solar panel, which is another source of heat that we use to help heat the, uh, the greenhouse in cool weather time. So uh, it's a lot of neat stuff. I didn't realize I was going to be involved in all this stuff until I got up to Springfield and, and uh, started working with that. But it started really applying itself to, you know what, this, this is really a big boon for the disability community in the world. If we can somehow create an opportunity for them to have a business where they could sell yes. their rabbits, they could sell the fur from the rabbit, they could eat the rabbit, they can eat the fish, they can eat the plants, they, they can all, they can be self-sustaining that way. And, and it really is a, is a blessing. Blessing. And so that's what uh, Compassion Link is, is uh, that's, just, that's just one little project we're doing right now. Uh, I, I'm just putting the finishing touches on a, on a disability manual for, for churches, how we can get disability ministry uh, involved in the local churches, and uh, 15 easy steps of, of uh, doing step one, two, three, four, five, just kind of puts it in order. It's kind of a really neat thing. And uh, excited about that coming out shortly. And, and God is just really doing some neat things. We're, uh, we're going to be going to Honduras. Uh, I'm going to be going to Honduras in uh, September and October. Uh, hopefully we're going to be going to the Gambia with the Julians later on this year. And Angela and I will be going to Germany later on during Christmas time this year. So we're excited about that. And then we're going to Ecuador uh, in February. It's really excited about what God's doing. And we couldn't do this if it wasn't for great people like you who support us monthly. I mean, when I came in and saw the poster on the board, I just get emotional every time I go into a church that we know supports us monthly. And it just, it warms our heart to know that we're being able to reach people for, with the gospel because of people like you. You say, I'm not doing much for the kingdom of God. You're being faithful. You're being faithful when you give to missions, when you give faithfully to the church and the tithe and offerings. You are affecting the kingdom of God. And I commend you for that. Your faithfulness is important. Your, your, your coming to church every Sunday is important. 
God will bless you for that. And God's blessing the world because of you. You have more of an effect than what you know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much, Tom. Angela, appreciate you guys. Boy, I got to watch more Nat Geo and learn stuff like this, Tom. I'm, I mean, I just feel like, boy, oh boy. It's good stuff. Come on up and make those announcements. Praise the Lord. Just want to make some announcements for the coming week. Um, we're, I'm really excited about what God is doing. Something, something is, is happening, and I'm really looking forward to the fall, um, all the different dynamics and the changes. Um, but I want you to take the rest of this summer for every opportunity to connect and get to meet new people. Women, tomorrow night, we kick back off our walk, walk the walk workout. Um, it's for women of all ages. We have a great time working it off, and I'm just excited about that. Come on out for that. Women's Fellowship on Tuesday. Tuesday mornings. Sandwich in the middle of the week on Thursday night is prayer. I can't say it enough. We can do a lot of stuff, but if we're not praying for what God, God wants to do, we're wasting our time. We're just keeping busy. Amen? Prayer is the furnace, and we know we have a lot of people who need us to pray, and um, we need direction from the Lord as to what He wants to do. Um, and then a reminder, next Sunday, we're going to be having the Providence Home Women's Teen Challenge here next Sunday morning. I love these women. And I'm going to tell you something. They are lit because because God just answered a major prayer for them. They needed a second home for like the, you know, like the second phase. And God provided them this awesome, beautiful house in Providence. Just, just provided it. And they posted it on Facebook. So I know Deb McDonald and the team there and the staff and Tabitha and the girls, they are lit and they are excited. And they want to thank those of you that were praying. They want you to know that. But next week, they're going to be here. And if you know anybody, and I don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody, who's struggling with an addiction of some kind or they're on the other end of it or maybe they're in the middle of it, you want to bring them out next Sunday or encourage them to come out because you're going to hear testimony of God's ability to change a life. So they're going to be here, song, testimony, all of that. We're going to have rain, rain, um, because Rain's not going to be there, weather permitting. We're having our like Connect Four barbecue after church. So we need you all to bring uh, food. Donna was so blown away by what came on Friday night. And they, as Pastor said earlier, whatever you made this past week, bring it again on Friday night is what Donna is trying to say. So we're going to have a lot of guests and a lot of visitors. And um, we're really, really excited. Invite people out. God is doing something. I'm telling you, I could feel, we could feel it through the, VB, uh, the sports camp. Something's shifting. Something's shifting. You'd be really surprised. The nets are going out. The people that you've been praying for for a long time and you've been like kind of holding off, now's the time to say, come on in. Come on in. Jesus wants you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's have all the children come forward. Pre-K to sixth grade. We're going to pray a blessing over them. Yeah, they should have did some of the songs. Praise God. Hey, buddy. Oh my goodness gracious, what a week. Did you have a good time, Paige? I think some of you are still tired though, right? How many just slept yesterday? Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> they were talking all over the place. It was amazing. It was amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just want to thank you so much, God. We want to thank you for each one of these children and their lives. We thank you for how special you make each and every one of them. God, we pray for your love, Lord God, to just fill their hearts, that you would protect them and keep them, and that, God, that they would be, Lord, hungry for you, that this would be a generation, Lord, that would rise up, Lord God, knowing you, Lord God, and not being afraid to tell their friends and others, Lord, yes. that you are real and that you love them, Lord. Father, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Fill the news, the Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Do I want to see this? I've been waiting all day to see this. That's awesome. We're going to wait upon you for our morning offering. The ushers are going to come. Keep the special touch group in prayer this week. God would bless them and use them mightily. Mike injured his eye this last week some time. We've been praying for him. Mike, you get better. We're going to anoint you with oil after the service and pray for you that God would touch you, all of you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, we just pray for that right now. We pray for all of them, Mike and Kim and Tom and Angela Lord. And Father, bless every one of them, oh God. 
We pray for Mike's eye that you would heal him and touch him, Lord, and minister God in a special way, Lord. Father, they need to be specially touched by you, Lord. Touch them and bless them and bless the ministry this week, Lord. We can't wait to hear the testimonies of all that you're going to do, Lord. Thank you, Father, for them. And bless this offering now, Lord God. Father, let us use it, Lord, to further your kingdom, to expand, Lord God, the greatness of our God throughout this world, Lord. And we ask you to bless the gift and giver and the tither and tither. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is for someone out there today. The Lord was giving this to me earlier. If someone has an issue with the protection of the Lord in their life, that they're doubting God in this area, and the message that he gave me was, if you ask me to go before you, I will. If you ask me to call down my angels to come and protect you, I will. So that's for someone. But before that, we're just going to sing a song called Our Great God. Thank you, Jesus. Eternal God, changing, mysterious, and unknown. Your boundless love. Thank you for having us today. <clears throat> Amen.
I'd like to share with you a little bit about what you're helping us do, and not just us, but also uh, the Compassion Link team, of which uh, Amy and David Julian, which you guys support and got family here in the church. We work... We work right around the corner from, from David's office and Amy's office, and, and we work on some of these projects together. And I have some pictures of things that we're actually doing together with the Julians. Uh, the first picture uh, that we have up there, <coughs> this, this is part of the special touch and the his ability portion of Compassion Link. Um, pet therapy is a big deal. For people with disability, uh, the numbers just go up really high. When, when someone with a disability has something that they can care for or something they can do, and pet therapy is a real thing, and it's really kind of a neat thing we're experimenting with, and rabbits really work really well for pet therapy. And, and uh, if you don't believe me, just ask the ladies at our office. They, they spoil my rabbits. These are my rabbits, and, and they're not just there to look pretty or to pet. We also have projects that we do with those rabbits. Uh, the next picture will show that black container right there. That black container, we actually take the rabbit waste and we put it in that black container, in that funnel, and we put it in there. Okay, so, so this is good stuff. Rabbit, rabbit uh, waste does not stink like chicken waste, okay? So you can, you can use that and you recycle it really quick. But what we make with, with that is we make a real potent fertilizer that we can put on our gardens. But not only that, we, the, it makes methane. It makes gas. And it's pumped from the black tank into the white tank right there. And we have enough methane captured in that tank. For every five pounds of waste from the rabbits and from the plant matter we put in there, it creates three hours of fuel that you can burn. You can use in a generator or a cook stove. And so people with disabilities can use that. They can raise their rabbits. They can heat their home or heat this greenhouse that we have right there. And in that greenhouse... It's all kind of recyclable stuff. It's all self-contained and sustainable. And, and we, we grow in that greenhouse. Go to the next picture. We have a garden bed right there that's completely an aquaponics or aquaponics uh, system. There's no dirt in that grow bed. That's all water. And our plants are growing there. And the water flows from that grow bed into another tank that is fish. We, we raise fish in those barrels. And we have right now, well, we just, we just harvested 50 catfish, but we have 100 tilapia in those, uh, in those tanks right now. And so the fish waste goes and fertilizes the plants, and it all kind of goes in a, in a big circle. But, but it's all heated by the different things right there. That You see the big barrel? was That's another heating source that we can use. We use, again, the waste material to burn in that. And then the next picture shows, uh, a lot of this is designed by David, by the way. Uh, he's really helped out. We have grow beds here with, with tires. We use old recyclable tires. to. All this is very accessible to people with disabilities because we find out that overseas, much of the disability community, the reason we have disabilities is because of poor nutrition, poor water. And, and then what do you do with the people who do have disabilities? They, they have no source of income except to beg. But with this, you see it's all small and self-contained and easily accessible to them. They can, they can sit in their chair and harvest their, their fruit. In, in our grow bed in the greenhouse, house, we can average 38 heads of lettuce a week. That's quite a bit. That we have two grow beds in there, and, and the, what you saw in there was, that's water spinach right there, and it's just, man, it grows too fast. And then you could take that, the leftover of that, uh, feed it to the rabbits. And so it's, it's all self-sustaining right there. And maybe one more picture. And that's our solar panel, which is another source of heat that we use to help heat the, uh, the greenhouse in cool weather time. So uh, it's a lot of neat stuff. I didn't realize I was going to be involved in all this stuff until I got up to Springfield and, and uh, started working with that. But it started really applying itself to, you know what, this, this is really a big boon for the disability community in the world. If we can somehow create an opportunity for them to have a business where they could sell their rabbits, they could sell the fur from the rabbit, they could eat the rabbit, they can eat the fish, they can eat the plants, they, they can all, they can be self-sustaining that way. And, and it really is a, is a blessing. And so that's what uh, Compassion Link is, is uh, that's just, 
That's just one little project we're doing right now. Uh, I, I'm just putting the finishing touches on a, on a disability manual for, for churches, how we can get disability ministry uh, involved in the local churches, and uh, 15 easy steps of, of uh, doing step one, two, three, four, five, just kind of puts it in order. It's kind of a really neat thing, and uh, excited about that coming out shortly, and, and God is just really doing some neat things. We're, uh, we're going to be going to Honduras. Uh, I'm going to be going to Honduras in uh, September and October. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be going to the Gambia with the Julians later on this year, and Angela and I will be going to Germany later on around Christmas time this year. So we're excited about that. And then we're going to Ecuador uh, in February. It's really excited about what God's doing. And we couldn't do this if it wasn't for great people like you who support us monthly. I mean, when I came in and saw the poster on the board, I just get emotional every time I go into a church that we know supports us monthly. And it just, it warms our heart to know that we're being able to reach people for, with the gospel because of people like you. You say, I'm not doing much for the kingdom of God. You're being faithful. You're being faithful when you give to missions. When you give faithfully to the church and the tithe and offerings, you are affecting the kingdom of God. And I commend you for that. Your faithfulness is important. Your, your, your coming to church every Sunday is important. God will bless you for that. And God's blessing the world because of you. You have more of an effect than what you know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you so much, Tom, Angela. Appreciate you guys. Boy, I got to watch more Nat Geo and learn stuff like this, Tom. I'm, I mean, I just feel like, boy, oh boy. It's good stuff. Come on up and make those announcements. Praise the Lord. I just want to make some announcements for the coming week. Um, we're, I'm really excited about what God is doing. Something, something is, is happening, and I'm really looking forward to the fall, um, all the different dynamics and the changes. Um, but I want you to take the rest of this summer for every opportunity to connect and get to meet new people. Women, tomorrow night, we kick back off our walk, walk the walk workout. Um, it's for women of all ages. We have a great time working it off, and I'm just excited about that. Come on out for that. Women's Fellowship on Tuesday. Tuesday mornings. Sandwich in the middle of the week on Thursday night is prayer. I can't say it enough. We can do a lot of stuff, but if we're not praying for what God, God wants to do, we're wasting our time. We're just keeping busy. Amen? Prayer is the furnace, and we know we have a lot of people who need us to pray, and um, we need direction from the Lord as to what He wants to do. Um, and then a reminder, next Sunday, we're going to be having the Providence Home Women's Teen Challenge here next Sunday morning. I love these women. And I'm going to tell you something. They are lit because God just answered a major prayer for them. They needed a second home for like the, you know, like the second phase, and God provided them this awesome, beautiful house in Providence, just, just provided it, and they posted it on Facebook. So I know Deb McDonald and the team there and the staff and Tabitha and the girls, they are lit and they are excited and they want to thank those of you that were praying. They want you to know that. But next week, they're going to be here. And if you know anybody, and I don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody who's struggling with an addiction of some kind or they're on the other end of it or maybe they're in the middle of it, you want to bring them out next Sunday or encourage them to come out because you're going to to hear testimony of God's ability to change a life. So they're going to be here, song, testimony, all of that. We're going to have rain, rain, um, because rain's not going to be there, weather permitting. We're having our like Connect Four barbecue after church. So we need you all to bring uh, food. Donna was so blown away by what came on Friday night. And they, as Pastor said earlier, whatever you made this past week, bring it again on Friday night is what Donna is trying to say. So we're going to have a lot of guests and a lot of visitors. And um, we're really, really excited. Invite people out. God is doing something. I'm telling you, I could feel, we could feel it through the, VB, uh, the sports camp. Something's shifting. Something's shifting. You'd be really surprised. The nets are going out. The people that you've been praying for for a long time and you've been like kind of holding off, now's the time to say, come on in. Come on in. Jesus wants you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's have all the children come forward. Pre-K to sixth grade. We're going to pray a blessing over them. Yeah, they should have did some of the songs. Praise God. Hey, buddy. Oh my goodness gracious, what a week.
Did you have a good time, Paige? I think some of you are still tired, though, right? How many of you slept yesterday? Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> they were all over the place. It was amazing. It was amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just want to thank you so much, God. We want to thank you for each one of these children and their lives. We thank you for how special you make each and every one of them. God, we pray for your love, Lord God, to just fill their hearts, that you would protect them and keep them, and that, God, that they would be, Lord, hungry for you, that this would be a generation, Lord, that would rise up, Lord God, knowing you, Lord God, and not being afraid to tell their friends and others, Lord, yes. that you are real and that you love them, Lord. Father, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Fill them and use them, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Do I want to see this? I've been waiting all day to see this. That's awesome. <laughs> We're going to wait upon you for our morning offering. The ushers are going to come. Keep the special touch group in prayer this week. God would bless them and use them mightily. Mike injured his eye this last week some time. We've been praying for him. Mike, you get better. We're going to anoint you with oil after the service and pray for you that God would touch you, all of you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, we just pray for that right now. We pray for all of them, Mike and Kim and Tom and Angela Lord. And Father, bless every one of them, O oh God. We pray for Mike's eye that you would heal him and touch him, Lord, and minister God in a special way, Lord. Father, they need to be specially touched by you, Lord. Touch them and bless them and bless the ministry this week, Lord. We can't wait to hear the testimonies of all that you're going to do, Lord. Thank you, Father, for them. And bless this offering now, Lord God. Father, let us use it, Lord, to further your kingdom, to expand, Lord God, the greatness of our God throughout this world, Lord. And we ask you to bless the gift and giver and the tither and tither. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is for someone out there today. The Lord was giving this to me earlier. That someone has an issue with the protection of the Lord in their life. That they're doubting God in this area. And the message that he gave me was, if you ask me to go before you, I will. If you ask me to call down my angels to come and protect you, I will. So that's for someone. But before that, we're just going to sing a song called, Our Great God. Thank you, Jesus. Eternal God, changing, mysterious, and
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't think I'm loud enough back there, Ralph. Can you give me some volume? So, somebody said, Pastor, you look nice today. Look like the mafia. <laughs> yep, that's me. Gary, the two timing, double crossing. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> the anointing is just dripping off this mafia man. This... <laughs> Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. Boy, anybody have any idea what those people were arguing about in Boston? Anyone see that going on in the uh, common there? Those protests that were going on? Anyone have an understanding of all that was going down there? It was a, it was a free speech rally. So the anti-free speech people showed up against the free speech people. And, you know, the anti-Nazi people showed up against, the, you know. I, I, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because I had no idea who was who yesterday. Just watching that go on. It's amazing how much uh, a rift is happening, isn't it? So much protest. I was very young back in the late 60s in grammar school, early 70s, and some of you more mature people may remember the days of protest and signs everywhere and all that went down, but I pray that our country does not go down that pike again. It probably will. There's so much tension, so much emotion, so much going on. But you know something? Even worse when it happens in a church and first Corinthians church had some kind of stuff going on there first Corinthians chapter 4 so so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court indeed I didn't not even judge myself my conscience is clear but that does not make me innocent it is the Lord Lord who judges me, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each one will receive his praise from God. When he says so then, the reason what he's addressing there is there is rifts going on in this church. There's division. And the division basically is there are two camps. One was kind of following Apollos. The other one was following Paul. And they kind of got into their camp. 
camps and kind of became, you know, camps that kind of jimmy these two people up. Now, Paul and Apollos were not trying to start anything. They didn't want anyone to follow them. They didn't want anyone to come after them and put them on such pedestals. And I don't know why some people must have thought Apollos was a better teacher than Paul. Paul was more charismatic, whatever was going on. But this was bringing some division in the church back then. And Paul, who has enough of it in chapter 3, verse 3, says, You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, another I follow Paulus, are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. And Paul says, we are just servants. We are just ministers. And the term there for ministers is under rowers. Under rowers were the galley slaves who rowed, <laughs> who pulled on the oars for the ship. And it's like he's saying, that's who we were. We were not captains. We were just slaves. And a slave says, no way, you know, a slave should not say to another a slave, I'm greater than you are. We are just servants. And then he says another term here, he likens himself to, to uh, stewards. When he says in verse 2, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. How many of you know this morning you have been given a trust this morning? You are a steward, which means you own nothing. You are a mere manager of all that God has entrusted to you. Your time, your talent, your treasure. And we are headlong heading to the day when we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account to the Master of how we handled His stuff. Yes. That's coming very soon. You realize that? Yes. But Paul is describing a steward. And the responsibility of a steward is to be faithful to his master. Right. And a steward may not always please other stewards in the household of God. A steward may not always please himself. But when he pleases his master, he is called what the Bible calls a good steward. Yes. And so is the story that Jesus taught of the parable of the faithful and wise manager in Luke chapter 12. That we are all stewards of our personal lives. We're all stewards of our home life. We're all stewards of what we do for God. And we're all going to give an account of that one day. Because the good stewards, Jesus says, will be adequately rewarded. They will be rewarded in the last day. Paul writes here, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. How many of you know that in life a steward is going to be judged? There are three kinds of judgments going on right now. We're all going to stand before the judge one day. And if you think about it, there's judgment going on right now. There are three kinds of judgments I want to talk to you about. The first one is man's judgment. Man's judgment. Our Bible College president, Dr. Crandall, in Bible College caught us all by surprise. He probably shouldn't have, but caught us all by surprise when in a ministerial leadership class that he used to teach to the entire school, entire student body, he said to every one of us, get ready, hear it from me right now, not everybody is going to like you. <laughs> And I'm listening to that and saying, no, <laughs> people aren't going to like me. People aren't going to like ministers. Doesn't everybody like ministers? We're preachers. We pray. We encourage. We're men of the cloth. And I know we only work one day, but we, <laughs> you know, we are special kind of people. We're handpicked by God. We're supposed to be, you know, his servants. Certainly everybody's going to like little old me. Wrong. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my. You know, I, I wouldn't doubt that we've had our, more of our fair share of critics, you know, in ministry in 26 years. And he was right. He spoke prophetically and he was like. He was absolutely right. And if you're in any kind of form of leadership, you're a supervisor, you're a foreman, you manage people, and you have people following you, guess what? Welcome to the wonderful world of criticism. <laughs> Amen? How many of you are business owners? Business owners. 
How many have had people that didn't like you? Anybody? Wow. Well, praise God. I don't feel so alone up here this morning. No doubt we've had our fair share of critics last week during sports camp. Pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. Provide a place, a venue for the kids. Have a good time. Spend time together. Have fun. No doubt there might have been kids, might have been parents that didn't like the way we did things and pulled their kid out. Can't please everybody. Can't please everybody. How do you fare when people criticize you? Whether in the sacred or the secular, how do you do it? How do you fare? How do you allow that stuff not to bother you? Not to keep you up at night? Not to grate on you? Because you can have 99 people who just think the world of you and think you're the best and the cat's meow. And then just have one who criticizes you. Where does your brain tend to gravitate? To the 99 or to the one? To the one, doesn't it? There's always somebody. Always there. I can feel like I'm in a zone and walk out of this church feeling, you know, pretty good. And feeling like I discharged the word of God. And I preach with all my heart. And feel like as, as NBA players would say I was in that zone, you know. And walk out of here and get home and open up my email. And in the subject line of my email it says today's sermon. <laughs> What? <laughs> Most times good. But when I see that, I said, oh boy. <laughs> Welcome to the NFL. <laughs> Do you have the uncanny ability to let stuff roll off? Do you have it? See, the Apostle Paul did not get upset when people criticized him because as far as he's concerned, you know, kind of as Rex Humbard once said, the only opinion that really matters to me is from the one who has nail prints in his hands. He really didn't care about people. He was all out for his master. But how do you become like Paul? How do you survive at some point where you don't pe take people so seriously? You know how you do it? Number one is when you don't take yourself so seriously. When you don't take yourself so seriously. See, my wife will tell you I have a tendency to take myself way too seriously, especially when I'm stressed, especially when I am irritated, especially when I am fearful. And I've noticed sometimes, I've noticed that when I get taking myself all too seriously over some matter, over something that comes my way, I become less effective in dealing with it. I become less effective. I kind of, you know, it, the, the situation just seems to grow because I, I'm, I'm terrible in dealing with it when I take myself too seriously. And I don't handle it very well. It makes me less effective. It may even cause the difficulty itself. If not, at least it's going to exacerbate it. And when I become way too self-important, I feel so much unnecessary weight that comes upon my shoulders and I just feel of just crushing me and weighing it down, the more and more I take myself all too seriously and my self-importance kind of grows and grows and gets bigger and bigger. I don't know if this is making sense to anybody, but you know, at such times I almost feel like saying to my wife, do you have any idea how important I think I am right now? <laughs> do you have any idea? But if we took ourselves less seriously, we would see the humor in the situation. We would see that there is a silver lining to this if we took ourselves less seriously. And taking oneself too seriously is assuming one is more important than he or she really is. And what happens is we expect way too much attention. We expect way too much respect. In 1 Kings chapter 19, remember when Elijah stood down those 400 Baal prophets on Mount Carmel? And remember God God answered his prayer and came down and licked up that sacrifice and the fire of God just kind of fell and the people came to the conclusion that Baal wasn't God. God is God and they all shouted out and he had those prophets killed and then he has this moment on top of Mount Carmel. We have these moments sometimes in the sun, don't we? Sometimes on the mountaintop. We have a mountaintop experience where everything is just going grand and not long after that he gets a criticism, more like a death threat 
from a queen named Jezebel who says, you know, may, may, may my life come to an end if not by this time tomorrow, I don't have your head on a silver platter. So Elijah hears this and runs for his life and he runs and runs and runs and runs till he finds himself exhausted and tired under a juniper tree. And when he gets under this juniper tree, he's tired, he's exhausted, and he begins to bemoan his situation. And suddenly all this self-importance kind of gets into him because he says to God, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. This is called what I would call the Elijah complex. That when things get dark and they get bleak and they get all that's wrong in the world, there's only one person that can save the day and that is me. <laughs> We've got to do something. I'm the only one. I'm the only godly one. I'm the only one that can do this. I'm the only one that can take care of this matter. So we blow ourselves. We blow the, the situation. The situation helps us to blow ourselves up in proportions that, you know what I'm saying, that are almost deified. And meanwhile, the, the wind gets taken out of God's balloon because he kind of shrinks in our thinking and our perception. And we perceive ourselves as the Savior, the, the Messiah. We've got to come through. And that's what self importance will do for people when they get into dark situations, dark times, they take upon way too much and expect themselves to do way too much than they're supposed to do. Chuck Swindoll once said, don't take yourself too seriously. After all, no one else does. <laughs> and if we take ourselves too seriously, our relationships suffer. No one wants to be around us. No one wants to be around us. They don't want to be. We're a burden to people. They want to tell us, lighten up. Lighten up. And we lose influence. Corey Ten Boom once said, look at the world and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. And look at Jesus and be at rest. And if there's anyone who, you know, had to learn to look to Jesus and be at rest was a concentration survivor like Corey Ten Boom who had an encounter with Jesus and can learn to see Him even in the darkest times. Sometimes we don't always find God when things are dark and bleak. And sometimes we find ourselves. We find ourselves so oh, too quickly. But sometimes we can't see God. We can't feel Him. Where'd He go? Where'd He go? Our Lord said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. The proud man doesn't want to do that. The proud man wants to handle it himself. I can do this. I can take care of it. I can do that. But what happens is, when we're not, you know, careful, all our self-importance is going to strip us of being having that childlike faith that Jesus wants us to have. And you say, well, I got mature faith. I'm an adult. I don't, I don't want to be a child again. Well, Jesus said, unless your faith is not like that of a little child, you're not going to. God. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't think I'm loud enough back there, Ralph. Can you give me some volume? So, somebody said, Pastor, you look nice today. Looks like the mafia. Yep, that's me, Gary, the two timing, double crossing. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> the anointing is just dripping off this mafia man. This <laughs> Praise God. First Corinthians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. 
Boy, anybody have any idea what those people were arguing about in Boston? Anyone see that going on in the uh, common there? Those protests that were going on? Anyone have an understanding of all that was going down there? It was a, it was a free speech rally. So the anti-free speech people showed up against the free speech people and, you know, the anti-Nazi people showed up against the, you know, I, I, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because I had no idea who was who yesterday, just watching that go on. It's amazing how much uh, a rift is happening, isn't it? So much protest. I was very young back in the late 60s in grammar school, early 70s, and some of you more mature people may rec remember the days of protest and signs everywhere and all that went down, but I pray that our country does not go down that pike again. It probably will. There's so much tension, so much emotion, so much going on. But you know something? Even worse when it happens in a church. And First Corinthians church had some kind of stuff going on there. First Corinthians chapter 4, so, so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each one will receive his praise from God. When he says so then, the reason what he's addressing there is there is rifts going on in this church. There's division. And the division basically is there are two camps. One was kind of following Apollos. The other one was following Paul. And they kind of got into their camps and kind of became, you know, camps that kind of jimmy these two people up. Now, Paul and Apollos were not trying to start anything. They didn't want anyone to follow them. They didn't want anyone to come after them and put them on such pedestals. And I don't know why some people must have thought Apollos was a better teacher than Paul. Paul was more charismatic, whatever was going on. But this was bringing some division in the church back then. And Paul, who has enough of it in chapter 3, verse 3, says, You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, another I follow Paulus, are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. And Paul says, we are just servants. We are just ministers. And the term there for ministers is under rowers. Under rowers were the galley slaves who rowed, <laughs> who pulled on the oars for the ship. And it's like he's saying, that's who we were. We were not captains. We were just slaves. And a slave says, no way, you know, a slave should not say to another, a slave, I'm greater than you are. We are just servants. And then he says another term here, he likens himself to, to uh, stewards. When he says in verse 2, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. How many of you know this morning you have been given a trust this morning? You are a steward, which means you own nothing. You are a mere manager of all that God has entrusted to you. Your time, your talent, your treasure. And we are headlong heading to the day when we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account to the master of how we handled his stuff. Yes. That's coming very soon. You realize that. Yes. But Paul is describing a steward. And the responsibility of a steward is to be faithful to his master. Right. And a steward may not always please other stewards in the household of God. A steward may not always please himself. But when he pleases his master, he is called what the Bible calls a good steward. Yes. And so is the story that Jesus taught of the parable of the faithful and wise manager in Luke chapter 12. That we are all stewards of our personal lives. We're all stewards of our home life. We're all stewards of what we do for God. And we're all going to give an account of that one day. Because the good stewards, Jesus says, will be adequately rewarded. They will be rewarded in the last day. 
Paul writes here, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives in men's hearts. How many of you know that in life a steward is going to be judged? There are three kinds of judgments going on right now. We're all going to stand before the judge one day. And if you think about it, there's judgment going on right now. There are three kinds of judgments I want to talk to you about. The first one is man's judgment. Man's judgment. Our Bible College president, Dr. Crandall, in Bible College caught us all by surprise. He probably shouldn't have, but caught us all by surprise when in a ministerial leadership class that he used to teach to the entire school, entire student body, he said to every one of us, get ready, hear it from me right now. Not everybody is going to like you. <laughs> And I'm listening to that and saying, no, <laughs> people aren't going to like me. People aren't going to like ministers. Doesn't everybody like ministers? We're preachers. We pray. We encourage. We're men of the cloth. And I know we only work one day, but we, <laughs> you know, we are special kind of people. We're handpicked by God. We're supposed to be, you know, his servants. Certainly everybody's going to like little old me. Wrong. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my. You know, I, I wouldn't doubt that we've had our, more of our fair share of critics, you know, in ministry in 26 years. And he was right. They spoke prophetically and he was like, he was absolutely right. And if you're in any kind of form of leadership, you're a supervisor, you're a foreman, you manage people and you have people following you. Guess what? Welcome to the wonderful world of criticism. <laughs> Amen. How many of you are business owners, business owners? How many have had people that didn't like you? Anybody? Wow. Well, praise God. I don't feel so alone up here this morning. No doubt we've had our fair share of critics last week during sports camp. Pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. Provide a place, a venue for the kids. Have a good time. Spend time together. Have fun. No doubt there might have been kids, might have been parents that didn't like the way we did things and pulled their kid out. Can't please everybody. Can't please everybody. How do you fare when people criticize you? Whether in the sacred or the secular, how do you do it? How do you fare? How how do you allow that stuff not to bother you, not to keep you up at night, not to grate on you? Because you can have 99 people who just think the world of you and think you're the best and the cat's meow. And then just have one who criticizes you. Where does your brain tend to gravitate? To the 99 or to the one? To the one, doesn't it? There's always somebody. Always there. I can feel like I'm in a zone and walk out of this church feeling, you know, pretty good. And feeling like I discharged the word of God. And I preach with all my heart. And feel like as, as NBA players would say I was in that zone, you know. And walk out of here and get home and open up my email. And in the subject line of my email it says today's sermon. <laughs> What? <laughs> Most times good. But when I see that, I said, oh boy. <laughs> Welcome to the NFL. <laughs> Do you have the uncanny ability to let stuff roll off? Do you have it? See, the Apostle Paul did not get upset when people criticized him because as far as he's concerned, you know, kind of as Rex Humbard once said, the only opinion that really matters to me is from the one who has nail prints in his hands. He really didn't care about people. He was all out for his master. But how do you become like Paul? How do you survive at some point where you don't pe take people so seriously? You know how you do it? Number one is when you don't take yourself so seriously. When you don't take yourself so seriously. See, my wife will tell you I have a tendency to take myself way too seriously, especially when I'm stressed, especially when I am irritated, especially when I am fearful. And I've noticed sometimes, I've noticed that when I get taking myself all too seriously over some matter, over something that comes my way, I become less effective in dealing with it. 
I become less effective. I kind of, you know, it, the, the situation just seems to grow because I, I'm, I'm terrible in dealing with it when I take myself too seriously and I don't handle it very well. It makes me less effective. It may even cause a difficulty itself. If not, at least it's going to exacerbate it. And when I become way too self-important, I feel so much unnecessary weight that comes upon my shoulders and I just feel it just crushing me and weighing it down. The more and more I take myself all too seriously and my self-importance kind of grows and grows and gets bigger and bigger. I don't know if this is making sense to anybody, but you know, at such times I almost feel like saying to my wife, do you have any idea how important I think I am right now? <laughs> do you have any idea? But if we took ourselves less seriously, we would see the humor in the situation. We would see that there is a silver lining to this if we took ourselves less seriously. And taking oneself too seriously is assuming one is more important than he or she really is. And what happens is we expect way too much attention. We expect way too much respect. In 1 Kings chapter 19, remember when Elijah stood down those 400 Baal prophets on Mount Carmel? And remember God God answered his prayer and came down and licked up that sacrifice and the fire of God just kind of fell and the people came to the conclusion that Baal wasn't God. God is God and they all shouted out and he had those prophets killed and then he has this moment on top of Mount Carmel. We have these moments sometimes in the sun, don't we? Sometimes on the mountaintop, we have a mountaintop experience where everything is just going grand and not long after that he gets a criticism, more like a death threat from a queen named Jezebel who says, you know, may, may, may my life come to an end if not by this time tomorrow, I don't have your head on a silver platter. So Elijah hears this and runs for his life and he runs and runs and runs and runs till he finds himself exhausted and tired under a juniper tree. And when he gets under this juniper tree, he's tired, he's exhausted and he begins to bemoan his situation and suddenly all this self-importance kind of gets into him because he's says to God, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. This is called what I would call the Elijah complex. That when things get dark and they get bleak and they get all that's wrong in the world, there's only one person that can save the day and that is me. <laughs> We've got to do something. I'm the only one. I'm the only godly one. I'm the only one that can do this. I'm the only one that can take care of this matter. So we blow ourselves. We blow the, the situation. The situation helps us to blow ourselves up in proportions that, you know what I'm saying, that are almost deified. And meanwhile, the, the wind gets taken out of God's balloon because he kind of shrinks in our thinking and our perception. And we perceive ourselves as the Savior, the, the Messiah. We've got to come through. And that's what self importance will do for people when they get into dark situations, dark times, they take upon way too much and expect themselves to do way too much than they're supposed to do. Chuck Swindoll once said, don't take yourself too seriously. After all, no one else does. <laughs> and if we take ourselves too seriously, our relationships suffer. No one wants to be around us. No one wants to be around us. They don't want to be. We're a burden to people. They want to tell us, lighten up, lighten up, and we lose influence. Corey Ten Boom once said, look at the world and be distressed, look within and be depressed, and look at Jesus and be at rest. And if there's anyone who, you know, had to learn to look to Jesus and be at rest was a concentration survivor like Corey Ten Boom who had an encounter with Jesus and can learn to see him even in the darkest times. Sometimes we don't always find God when things are dark and bleak. And sometimes we find ourselves. We find ourselves oh too quickly. But sometimes we can't see God. We can't feel him. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Our Lord said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. The proud man doesn't want to do that. The proud man wants to handle it himself. I can do this. I can take care of it. I can do that. But what happens is we're not, you know, careful, all our self-importance is going to strip us of being, having that childlike faith 
faith that Jesus wants us to have. And you say, well, I got mature faith. I'm an adult. I don't, I don't want to be a child again. Well, Jesus said, unless your faith is not like that of a little child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. See, a child, a child doesn't have that kind of self-importance. That child doesn't, you know, take on him all that stuff and think of himself too seriously. Jesus said, be like them. Stop taking yourself too seriously. Stop taking yourself. Be like the child. Be like children. Have that kind of faith in me. To trust in me. And trust in me. The next thing that will help you to, you know, get over criticism or taking yourself too seriously is humor. Is humor. The Chronicle of Higher Education posted an article one time entitled The Science of Laughter. And the author says some pretty interesting stuff. He said a positive emotional state is, is a benefit in helping us deal with the stresses and strains of being human. Second, having a good sense of humor helps us to rally social support around us when times are tough. Having people in your corner during tough times is very good for you. There's clear research around that. And third, and most intriguing to me, the author writes, is that making jokes about the challenges in life can fundamentally change the way we think about those challenges. You know, there's a resilience that comes from laughter. Laughter breeds resilience. It does. It becomes octane to pick ourselves up. Laughing, as someone said, is the quickest way to get up and get going again when you've been knocked down. There was a minister who was full of energy and enthusiasm for the Lord. He was just, you know, a, just a box of Cheerios. You know, he just saw he had the, the glean of the Lord, always, up, you know, upbeat and positive. He goes to visit this man in the hospital. And when he gets in there and visits this man in the hospital, he sees the man all cut, hooked up with tubes and all kinds of wires and all kinds of stuff going every which way. And he's thinking, well, I'm going to cheer him up. And immediately he kind of dies right in there. Be of good cheer, my friend. And he starts quoting all these scriptures and all these scriptures and, you know, and just telling him, you know, to get better and God is going to heal you. Have faith. Have faith. And he's going on and on and on. And suddenly the man begins to wave, wave his hands. He couldn't talk to him because that stuff in his mouth. And the man, the minister thought, yeah, I'm doing a good job. I'm doing a good job. He keeps praying for him, keeps ministering to him. And finally he prays this eternal prayer for this guy. And at the final amen, he sees the guy take a piece of paper and, and a pen and write something down. And after he did that, he kind of went over to the side and went kind of in, unconscious. And the minister said, Boy, did I have an effect on him. Wow, my prayer must have been powerful. And all of a sudden, he opens up the piece of paper and, and reads what the man wrote to him. And then what the man wrote to him, it says, you're standing on my oxygen tube. Sometimes people need a break. I'm here. I'm here. We don't want you here. You know, I think as ministers, we're supposed to fish for men. But I tell you, when we use depth charges and start launching depth charges, we just blow people out of the water. Amen? <laughs> Emily Sellers from the Indigo Girls once said, you have to laugh at yourself because you cry your eyes out if you didn't. You know, some people think it's a sin to, to laugh. It's a sin to laugh. Don't you dare laugh. Don't you dare laugh, especially in church. There's no laughter in church. I know there's no crying in baseball, but, you know, Ecclesiastes 3 says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And one of those seasons is a time to laugh. Sometimes it's just good old laughter. I can't imagine a world without laughter. Can you? You know, I... Lord, give us humor. Let us see humor. Let us be humor givers. Let us be people who are humorous. I never dated any girl that had no sense of humor. Never did. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs>
But you know, when you go through the tough times, humor is going to kind of win the day for you. When you're going through the good times, humor even, you know, even enhances the blessings that come. You know what I'm saying? Even in the good times. God wants us to enjoy Him and all His benefits. All of His benefits. Proverbs 17, 22, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I love how the English version puts it, being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. Oh man, no fun being gloomy all the time. I don't know about you, but it's good medicine to be cheerful. It's good medicine to, to uh, have a cheerful look on your face because somebody sees that and they themselves are encouraged. Comedian Victor Borgay summed it up. He said, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. You know, laughter has a way of changing the perspective and altering the moods physiologically. You know, it has a way of relaxing the muscles and boosting our immune system, releasing endorphins to Increasing stress hormones, increasing blood flow to the heart. You know, laughter can do all that. It's good for us. The merry heart do it good, you know, like a medicine. It cheers you up and empowers you. It gives you resilience. It helps you not to take yourself too seriously. I'm not advocating people to laugh themselves into denial and laughing themselves, you know, laughing a situation off that may be serious and just laughing it away. Say, well, that doesn't bother me, doesn't bother me. They don't bother me. Sure they do. Sure they do. But there are times, there's a balance sometimes of seeing the humor and stuff, seeing the, the lightness, the brevity of it. That's all it's going to be. It's just brief. It's not, this too shall pass. But people just relaxing and, you know, just keeping their eyes on Jesus. One day I'm going to die. And on that day of my funeral, I'll have a pastor friend get up here. Maybe here, maybe at a funeral parlor and say nice things about me, I hope. <laughs> and eulogize me in a wonderful and special way. And then not long after that, that same minister is going to go and wonder where the potato salad is and talk about the Red Sox and talk about whatever's under the sun. I'm going to be surely, you know, an afterthought. Amen? So let's just kind of laugh it off. Let's just lighten up. See, the keys to taking a people's criticism so seriously or not taking it so seriously is, you know, you stop taking yourself so seriously. Number two, humor. And number three, lightening up by lightening the load of another. You want to lighten up? Lighten the load of another one, of somebody else. Getting over yourself really is thinking about other people. There was one doctor who said one of the major causes of poor self-esteem is self-absorption. Self That's right. Poor self-esteem comes from being wrapped up with self. Just wrapped up with self. Dr. Carl Menninger was asked this question, what would you advise a person to do if he felt a nervous breakdown coming on? They thought his answer would be, go see a psychiatrist. His answer wasn't that at all. He said, lock up your house, go across the railroad tracks, find someone in need and do something to help that person. That's right. You want to lighten up? Lighten the load of another person. Be other people minded. Stop focusing yourself on yourself. It eliminates all the debates, especially the debate with yourself. How many have ever had a debate with yourself? Any of you guys ever shaved before and have a conversation with yourself in the mirror? Anyone ever have a conversation with themselves in the shower? Anyone ever have a conversation with yourself while you're driving along all by yourself and you're rattled and this couldn't get worse? Is there anyone in this church? church who is honest enough to say I have had a conversation with myself and I can tell you it wasn't a good one. <laughs> Proverbs 15.30, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart and God, good news gives health to the bones. Nothing like a smile, nothing like a cheerful look, nothing like, you know, just pat on the back, comment of appreciation. I hate, pray that Janice and I do that enough. You know, appreciation, words of affirmation, that may be your love language, a pat on the back, encouragement. I pray that we can speak each other's love language around here and demonstrate that. Amen? The next judgment in the life of a steward behind man's judgment, there is the servant's own self-judgment. There's a servant's own self-judgment. Paul knew that nothing was amiss in his ministry in his life. It didn't mean he called himself perfect, but he was so taken up with the things of God. But sometimes we don't really know ourselves very well. And sometimes we have to look and 
inside of our heart. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Every now and then we've got to ask ourselves, like I used to do when I got new jobs, but a month after, you know, I'd ask the boss, how am I doing? What am I doing? Am I doing things right? Am I, you know, meeting your needs? Am I, am I doing a good job for the company? I'd ask myself that question. I'd ask the boss that question. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves, how am I doing in my relationship with God? Am I praying? Am I reading his word? Am I, you know, have I got faith? What's my attitude been through all the situations? And Paul understood there was a fine line between a clear conscience and a self-righteous attitude. He understood that. He said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Do you realize that every single human religion has humanity working before a watching God? Every single one, every religion has humanity working before a watching God. Do you realize that Christianity now is God working before a watching humanity? It's just the opposite. That when you think of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, it is the opposite of us standing center stage and us thinking that we are the actors, we are the players, we are the ones performing, we are the ones doing. The gospel changes all that. It puts the person on the platform out into the seats, out into the auditorium to watch God perform, to watch God work, to watch God die on an old rugged cross for your sins and my sins. It changes everything. So the self-importance that would come from standing on a stage in life gets relegated to being out into the audience and watching the importance of God Almighty and what He did 2,000 years ago. It changes everything. It takes the seriousness out of us think, taking ourselves too seriously. And Paul used to take himself very, very seriously. He he was one whose religion brought such self-importance and such self-righteousness. He writes in Philippians 3, 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, legalistic righteousness. I was faultless. Boy, was I religious. Boy, was I righteous. Boy, did I keep that law. Boy, was I the best religious student. Boy, I had the best teacher in Gamaliel. Man, I had the best, the best, I was the best, I was the best, I was the best. And all of that religion did nothing but just inflate his self-importance and reflate his ego and made him too all too serious. And the more he became serious about his religion, his religion made him even more serious, the less spiritual he was and the less of God he had until the day came when he meets Christ on a road to Damascus. And when he meets Christ, the one who died for him, the one that he was persecuting, all of that changed. And he said, you remember all that religion, all that stuff, all that working hard to make myself righteous before God? Do you know what I did with all that stuff? I chucked it. It was all like cow doo-doo. It was like rabbit doo-doo. Go use it for something else. It was all dung. It was just, you know, it was wasted energy. And I got rid of it all. And now there's, I was liberated from myself. I was liberated from my self-importance. Now I know who is the important one. I was liberated. I was set free. The, the joy of the Lord is my strength now. I don't have to work. I don't have to work so hard. I don't have to try to be righteous before God. It's His righteousness that's imparted to me. My unrighteousness is imparted to Him because of what He did. And now I'm free in Christ and my life is now hidden with Christ in in God. It's hidden. And I'm dead to this world, so nothing that people do to me can kill me. I'm already a dead man. I'm already alive to God, but dead to this world. So that's why Paul writes, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Paul says, I don't even care what you think of me. I don't care what I think of myself. What's important is what God thinks of me. And that's being delivered from being self-focused to being Christ-focused. Simple as that. 
There's joy in that. Yeah. There's joy in that. And then we come into church sometimes, thinking we got to put on, we got to put on, we got to put on. Just be yourself. Just come in here and relax. Know that God loves you. Even if you don't sing a note, even if you don't, can't carry a tune in the bucket like me, even if you're just, you're just here, you're not just taking up space here. You matter to God. Right. You matter to God. Right. He loves you. He has a plan and purpose for your life. And he would just love to grab all of the chains and the weights and all the shackles and all the stuff you have on yourself. Just rip it off and spread your wings and soar and be all that I've called you to be. Be all that I've called you to be. Lastly, the judgment in life of a steward behind man's judgment and our own self-judgment is the most important judgment, which is God's judgment. And Paul writes here, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. I said from the very beginning, don't take yourself too seriously, but be sure to take God seriously. Yes. Never, never, never will there be a time when I say don't take Him seriously. Right. Every moment of our lives, we should be taking Him seriously. Yes. We have to take Him seriously. Rick Warren once said, show me, show me someone who takes themselves too seriously, and I'll show you someone who doesn't take God seriously enough. You know, when I take God seriously, I'm, I'm freed now. I can get my eyes off myself. I can get my eyes off myself. Because a Christ-centered person can understand the balance between concern about their life and their walk with Jesus. I've got concerns in my life. I've got bills to pay. I've got stuff going on. i got, you know, gas in my car to worry about. But I can still enjoy God. I can still enjoy Him. I can still know that He meets my every need. I can still know that God loves me. That God can take care of me. And I know that my relationship with Him needs to be a serious one. And I need to walk with Him and walk closely with Him every day of my life. Every single day. Micah 6, 8, I love it. We sing a song about it. It says, He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. You know, the message words a little differently. He says, but He's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to, to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And it says this, and don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. That's Micah 6, 8 in the, the message. Amazing. Amazing. You know, when you take God seriously, it takes the pressure off of you of being too serious, of being too serious. Some people are turned off by church when there's, you know, when there's all kinds of uh, spiritual hype going on. Why were the crowds so attracted to Jesus back then? I, I just think he was so simple. Yes. He, he was just so simple. People just, he attracted so many people from all walks of life. He attracted the wrath of the religious people who took themselves all too seriously. He butted heads with those people. But there he was sitting amongst, you know, tax collectors and drunkards and people that were, you know, in sin and, you know, prostitutes. And he got, he got railed on because of it. Look at that man. He can't be from God. He's hanging around with sinners. He was more comfortable with sinners than he was religious people. And he was so simple that he had, you know, chips and, and you know, chips and dip and all kinds of fish and chips with 5,000 people in the desert. Amen? With tartar sauce. He was pretty simple in his approach and his relationships. And that's why people gravitated to him. There was no smoke and mirrors. There was no light show. There was no anything. We don't have that here. Turn the lights on at you know, altar time to create an atmosphere of privacy so for you to spend time with the Lord. But we have no smoke machines here. We have no smoke machines. We have, we're not darkening the place so that you can't see anybody. So we can't see us. So as to accentuate the worship team. The worship team don't want you even staring at them. Worship team wants you to focus on Him. Amen? And we just want the power of God. We don't want to cut power to the electricity. We want to hook up to the power of Almighty God. The Spirit of the Lord. And Jesus said, man, my church is just going off on these tangents. Just going off on these tangents and doing all this stuff. Just be real. Just be simple. Just be who you are. Amen. 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 Am
Jesus was a light that appeared to people who sat in darkness. He walked in. Demons ran out. We want Jesus to walk in. We want the Jesus of Nazareth to walk up and down these aisles, touching people's lives and blessing people and meeting them at their biggest needs and the deepest needs, wherever they are. We don't need it. We can drive ourselves crazy. Should we shut the lights off? How about we put one bank on? No, one bank, two banks, three banks. Shut these lights off. Let's get smoke. Let's get all this stuff. You guys dress down. You guys don't dress up. You know, we just... We can go crazy. I hit my knees and I just... Give us the Holy Spirit. That's all we need. Just give us the Holy Spirit. Give us the Holy Spirit. Just give us the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I said this morning that, you know, we aren't to take ourselves too seriously. God took us seriously. He took us seriously to die on a cross for us. And shed His holy, innocent blood for us sinners. So that your sins could be nailed there with Him. You don't have to work for your salvation. He did the work. You don't have to earn it. You couldn't earn it. He already paid the price for you to receive by faith the salvation that comes from His dying on a cross for all of us. Yes, He took us seriously. Yes, He took you seriously. When you, He was on the cross, you were on His mind. Even if you're the only one on the face of the earth, He would have died for you. He would have died for you. And I don't see a, a God who is lonely and needed fellowship. I see a God who created people in His image. And that, that relationship got broken in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. And suddenly we became, you know, kind of at enmity with God. Our sins, you know, we, we were shut out from the, from the Garden of Eden. We were shut out. God put an angel there with a flaming sword. He can't go back. Well, there's a whole heaven that now is open to those who put their faith in Christ. And Jesus said to enter that heaven, you must be born again. You must be born again. Flesh can't inherit flesh. Our flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We must be born again. You must be born from above. And you're dead in spirit, which became dead in all of us were born in sin, the Bible says, became alive in Christ Jesus. He's the second Adam, the light quickening spirit, kind of like lighting the candle inside of a jack-o'-lantern. You know, inside there is all kinds of gunk and mush and all kinds of stuff inside the jack-o'-lantern. You know what I'm saying? Until that candle gets put inside of there and gets lit, that frown turns into a smile and lights up inside of us. And all of a sudden, all that junk and gunk inside of us, God begins to work and get it out of us and lift it off all the burdens all the weights all the sins all the worries all the anxieties and all of a sudden his peace begins to flood us and make us whole people just want to be whole today I, I swear people just want to be whole they just want to be made well they want to be free of their stuff and all the things that weigh them down just lay aside all the hype there's no hype here we just want the Holy Spirit here Holy Spirit will bring the hype Holy Spirit will bring the power. Yes. Holy Spirit will bring the holiness. Holy Spirit will bring the healings. Holy Spirit will bring the baptisms. Holy Spirit will bring the changed life. The Holy Spirit is going after your prodigals. Yes. The Holy Spirit is going after prodigal spouses. Holy Spirit is going after prodigal children. Holy Spirit is going to do all that. Don't try to be the Holy Spirit. Don't try to be the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life because you're so serious. No. Loosen up. Lighten up. Just be yourself. Let the Holy Spirit who is serious about their situation have his way in their situation and let him do all the work. Amen? Yes. Let him do all the work. Someone once wrote, isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common folks like you and me all are builders for eternity to each is given a book of rules a block of stone and a bag of tools and each must shape ere time has flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Let's stand together everybody in the house of the Lord Invite the worship team, you guys, you come on back. Hallelujah.
Jesus. Love you. You know, love, joy, and hallelujah. peace belong to the Lord, don't they? Yes. Thank, thank you, Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, we come to you this morning. Whom shall we fear? Lord, we thank you. We praise your name this morning. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We just Thank lift you. up our hearts and spirits to you this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come be with us, Lord. Be 
What your mercy did. 